Hello everyone. In this video we're going to be solving a nice functional equation. We have f of x plus 1 over x equals x to the 7th power plus 1 over x to the 7th power. And we're going to be finding f of 1. We're also going to take a look at if we can find an expression for f of x. And the first thing we're going to do is actually take a look at the graph of this function that's inside the parentheses. So suppose you set this equal to g of x or y, then the graph of that would look like this. Notice that this function is not one-to-one -one on any interval. There's actually a point at which, you know, the increasing decreasing behavior changes and we can actually find it by using a little bit of calculus. So let's go ahead and do that first. If you set g of x equal to this and differentiate it, you get one minus one over x squared. You probably memorize if you've done calculus, the derivative of one over x is negative one over x squared or you can use the power rule. And by setting this equal to zero, we get two values, x is equal to plus minus one. So obviously there are two pieces to the graph because of the symmetry. If you replace x with negative x, you get the other piece. So they're perfectly symmetrical. And what happens is we have a minimum and a maximum on different intervals. So at one, we actually have the minimum point here and that tells us that our function is going to be increasing on 1 to infinity and 0 to 1, it is going to be decreasing if you just consider positive values, right? So here's the million dollar question. If we have f of x plus 1 over x equals something, can we find an expression for f of x from here, right? How do we do that? Well, we can start by setting this equal to something. How about setting it equal to y, right? Okay, if you set that equal to y, then you get the following equation, x plus 1 over x equals y, and then from here we get x squared plus 1 over x equals y, and x squared plus 1 equals yx. Obviously, you can write this as a quadratic equation in x, x squared minus yx plus 1 equals 0, and by solving this quadratic, you actually get two solutions which explains why our function is not always one-to-one, -one, right? x equals y plus minus the square root of b squared, which is y squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. So we're, we're going to consider two solutions, which is this one and this one. So x sub 1 and x sub 2. Obviously, this kind of gives us x as f inverse of y, right? We can basically set this equal to f inverse of y. So if you were trying to write, or actually, is it g? Yeah, I think we called it um, g, so it should be probably be g inverse of y. And then from here, we can find, because f is different, right? We should be able to find from here, g inverse of x. Obviously, obviously all you have to do is just replace this y with x, and that should give you g inverse of x equals x plus the square root of x squared minus 4 over 2. Now, how does finding the inverse help us? Well, you can basically replace our expression with that inside the parentheses, right? Replace x with this, and that should give you f of x. But that's going to be super painful, don't you think? But you can definitely proceed that way. But I have a better idea. At least you got the idea of how we can solve this equation. When would we have two solutions or how can I find intervals for which these equation, equations are the same? For example, if you just consider the case that y squared minus 4 is equal to 0, from here you get y equals plus minus 2. Now what does that mean in terms of x? If you think about it, we set x plus 1 over x equal to y. And when x plus 1 over x equals 2, from here you get a single real solution. That will be x equals 1. And with the negative 2, you only get negative 1. So those are going to be our critical values. Therefore, at that point, you're basically talking about a tangent line, which touches the graph at one point. Make sense? Otherwise, you have a curve like this, and obviously any horizontal line will intersect at more than one point, which means the function is going to have two inverses. That's why the intervals are important, but hopefully you get the general idea. Let's go ahead and take a look at this problem from another perspective because we don't really need to find f of x or an expression for f of x if we are looking for a particular value. 
the value of the function at x equals 1, right? In other words, we are looking for f of 1, and to find f of 1, we don't always have to find an expression for f of x. How do we find f of 1 then? Easy. You just set the expression inside the parentheses equal to 1, and then try to find the x value or something like that, and plug it in on the right-hand side. Whatever you use for x on the left-hand side must be used on the right-hand side because it needs to be consistent. So let's go ahead and find out what happens as a result by setting x plus 1 over x equals equal to 1. One of the things you probably know is if x is positive, then x plus 1 over x is always going to be greater than or equal to 2. Why? You can actually prove this. And for negatives, it's going to be a little different on the flip side, right? But for positive values, at least this is what it is. So can my x plus 1 over x equal to 1 then? Yes, but not for real x values. Let's go ahead and find x from here. We're going to make a common denominator or just multiply everything by x. You get the following and you probably know, hopefully, that this equation has no real solutions. And this should remind you of something special, but before I talk about it, let's go ahead and find the x values from here first. Negative b plus minus the square root of b squared, which is 1 minus 4, which is a negative 3, which can be written as square root of 3i divided by 2. And if you write it like this, do you think this looks familiar to you? And if it doesn't, let's go ahead and consider the positive case or the plus sign case. And let's kind of separate them. Does this ring a bell? I hope it does, because you're basically looking at the cube roots of negative 1, right? In other words, this is cosine of 60 or pi over 3, and this is sine of pi over 3. Therefore, we can write this using Euler's formula or just in trigonometric form, and from there, we should be able to find it, right? For, so if x can be written as e to the power i times pi over 3, then I think finding x to the 7th would be fairly easy, don't you think? Well, x to the 7th is just going to be e to the power i times 7 pi over 3. But notice that 7 pi over 3 is greater than 2 pi because it contains 6 pi over 3 plus pi over 3. So it's actually equivalent to e to the i times pi over 3 <laughs> value-wise, right? And that is going to be the same as this one. So it's kind of like a very interesting equation whose seventh power equals itself. So what does that mean? That means if x to the seventh equals x, then one over x to the seventh is gonna be one over x. So x to the seventh plus one over x to the seventh is gonna be the same as x plus one over x. So therefore, f of one for this equal to one, this also equals one, therefore f of one is just going to be one. Does that make sense? Obviously, there's another way to approach this problem, taking it from here, if x squared minus x plus 1 is equal to 0, multiply both sides by x plus 1. I know some people are going to object to this, like, where on earth does this come from? It comes from the cube roots of negative 1. And from here, by replacing x cubed with negative 1, you're going to be able to find that x to the 7th is x to the 3rd squared times x, which gives you 1x, which is x. Again, this brings us to the exact same point. And... This brings us to the end of the video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.